All right, so we're going to get going here with our lecture on the first chapter of our course textbook. And so we're going to cover two sections in this. So this is the book Advanced Engineering Mathematics. by Peter V. O'Neill, and this is the eighth edition. And we're going to be going over the first chapter, the first two sections. And so where we ended in class last time was we ended by having talked about what ordinary differential equations are, partial differential equations. We had motivated some of our discussion by saying, okay, differential equations, they come out in chemical engineering in a lot of ways, including in things like saying accumulation equals in minus out plus generation. And so um, that leads us to talking about how do you actually start to solve differential equations? We had discussed what the meaning of a solution of a differential equation was and Therefore, we want to know how to get those. So um, we are going to first look at solutions to separable equations. This is a very special type of a differential equation. We're looking very specifically at single state. So essentially not a system of ODEs. So only a single ODE, and it has a single state or a single dependent variable. And um, we looked before at models of the type like D and J over DT. This is going back to our, um, our mass balance that we did the last time. KCAV, this is if we have um, a first order reaction rate in our batch reactor. And so this would be K times, um, I should have written here like CJ, sorry about that. NJ over V times V. And so this will say that DNJ over DT is equal to KNJ. You could also do it the other way where you write NJ as equal to, um, or NJ over V as CA. So then what you would get is probably the more familiar form that we have from reaction engineering, DCA equals KCA. And that's if you divide um, this one by volume on both sides and you replace the J with an A. And then, um, so this is a separable equation. And so um, that's because you can write it in a way where you can separate the variables and then easily solve it. And so, um, let's talk about the procedure for solving a separable equation. So we're going to write this procedure with respect to an example. So here's something that looks a little similar, but this one we're removing any like physical relevance. We're just gonna say, okay, here's a separable equation. Let's just consider this. So the procedure, we'll talk about why this works in a minute because if you know your calculus well, you're probably going to be like, what the heck? But then um, the first step, is to separate variables. By putting every expression. Involving the unknown function. on the left and everything involving the independent variable on the right. And this is going to include the dn and dt also. I should have also noted that actually um, Primarily, my notes for this are actually taken from a different book, so I 
I mentioned that those are the chapters that we're going through so that for CHE 7100, you're able to look at those, but I'm actually not really taking these notes from there. I'm actually taking them from a different book. And so this other book is called Differential Equations. Second edition by um, Folking. Sorry, I forgot a G here. Arnold. And so I'm actually taking a lot of things just verbatim out of this one. So um, that'll give you a better sense of where I'm getting this information. Um, okay, so let's see what that step looks like. So if it is, um, if this is our differential equation, we're going to move the n's to one side and the t's to the other. So it will become dn over n is equal to negative lambda dt. Now, this is the part where um, if you know your calculus well, you'd say like, I don't know if you can really do that with a derivative that just split it up like this. Um, so good point. But we'll talk about why these are the steps in this procedure in a minute, even if maybe in a mathematical sense, that's kind of a, not strictly exactly what we're doing, um, but that's the steps that you can use to remind yourself of how the procedure goes, which will be clarified later. So this is if n is not equal to zero. So we'll also come back to that point. So then you're going to integrate both sides. So when you do this, you're going to end up that the integral of one over n dn is equal to negative lambda of the integral of dt, which is equal to ln of the absolute value of n plus some constant that's for the integral over here on the left-hand side. And then it is equal to negative lambda t plus the constant coming from the indefinite integral on the right-hand side then you can combine those two constants. So you can say, let me call C equals C2 minus C1. And this is going to leave you with um, ln of the absolute value of N is equal to negative lambda T plus C. So that's what we get. And then um, now we're going to solve for N. So the third step is solve for N. So then what you would do is you would say, okay, so N of T, is equal to e to the negative lambda t plus c, which is equal to e to the c, e to the negative lambda t. And then um, these are clearly both positive because the exponential, no matter what argument you give it, is always a positive number. So this will give us that n of t is equal to e to the c, e to the negative lambda t, if n is greater than zero, or it will give negative e to the c e to the negative lambda t if n is less than zero. And so just as the re reminder, if you saw that um, our introduction to calculus video, you'll have seen where we redefined um, what the absolute value was. And so we said it's the argument if um, the thing that's in the absolute value is positive, we said it's equal to the negative of that if this thing is actually um, negative. And so that's what's going on there. And then, so um, if we were to call this number A equals E to the C, if N is greater than zero and it's negative E to the C, if N is less than zero, then we can write this in a much more compact way as N of T is equal to A E to the negative lambda T, where as the N um, is different, the a is also different. And so, um, yeah, so with that, we get that A is there for a constant. It's not zero according to this, but, um, but we do want to account for that case where what if N is equal to zero? So before we said, what if it's not equal to zero? So N is not equal to zero in the derivation above. But if A equals zero in the N of T equals A E to the negative lambda T, 
then n of t is always equal to zero. And so we can say, oh, is that, is that right? So if we have dn over dt equals negative lambda n, and we try n is equal to zero, this definitely is satisfied. And so in general, then you could say, oh, okay, I guess that n of t equals a e to the negative lambda t is a general solution where um, here's what I do if n is greater than zero or n is less than zero. And then if n is zero, I use a is zero. And so, um, so notice here that the solution is a function. So that goes right along with what we said last time about the definition of solutions of differential equations. They are functions that satisfy the differential equation. And um, if we had initial conditions here, they would have to meet those. And so um, explicitly, this one is able to give you a prediction of what n should be at future times. So that kind of thing is very useful in engineering. But I think, um, as I noted before, like it is these very small problems where we're able to solve them by hand. In most research problems where things are a lot more complex and we're trying to take more of the complexities into account, you're not going to be faced with problems where you can solve them by hand. But um, I think it's still helpful for some different ways. So one of the things is so that you gain intuition because a lot of times um, as you get higher and higher up in, in research, especially in things that pertain to mathematics, then there will be all of these generalized statements where it is um, perhaps more difficult to understand them. But if you can make a small example and demonstrate them to yourself, a lot of times um, the like more broad, all encompassing mathematical results are going to make a lot more sense. So there is value in being able to take small examples and know what to do with them to help you understand um, the larger examples. And so um, that's why we are reviewing all these things. So, um, Something, for example, that's a good indicator of how understanding a small example can give you some intuition about what goes on for larger ones is let's go back to our um, CSTR again. So with the, or sorry, not our CSTR, it was our batch reactor. Um, let's go back to this DNJ over DT equals RJV. So um, let's say that A is the reactant. So it is consumed. So it's um, being consumed with time and B is the product. And so um, let's say that the rate that they're consumed slash produced is KCA. So this would be like the rate at which B is produced. So put a negative there if A is being consumed. So then we'll say that D and A over DT equals negative, because I said that this one's being consumed negative KCAV. And then we also have D and B over DT is equal to KCAV because this one's being produced at the same rate as A is being consumed. And so then um, these are separable differential equations. And so if you solve these, you will see that you will get something to the effect that CA is equal to E to the negative KT plus, I'm gonna call it C1 bar for the constant associated with that. And so um, if we were to try to mimic what happened before, we would say, oh, okay, let me, um, we have this absolute value, it would be e to the c1, e to the negative kt, if ca is greater than zero, and negative e to the c1, e to the negative kt, if ca is less than zero. And then, but no, um, ca is never going to be less than zero. ca is concentration. You're not going to have this one happen physically. So that one goes away, and so you're left with this solution. Now, um, what this means is that effectively, I'm going to I'm going to simplify this. I'm going to call this term a um, with a bar. So ca is equal to a bar e to the negative kt. And then we also, if we did the same thing for b, we would get cb equals b e to the kt. Now, something important that you can see even from just this small example by solving it is that you can see this phenomenon of what we call um, stability. So if you think about time going to infinity here, e to the negative infinity is going to go to zero and e to the infinity is going to keep increasing. And we know that at some point there would have to be um, some limit to actually the CB concentration. Well, that's the thing because we're in a batch reactor. So like, I mean, you're not gonna run your thing till time is infinity. 
So that's why you're never going to see that. But, um, but in your batch reactor, you can see that what this means is you're going to decrease your reactant and you're going to keep producing B until um, all of your reactant is consumed and you have nothing more to make B with. But you can see already that just from this, you can get some intuition into the physics of your process. And, um, and also, yeah, I think I said stability, but um, I, shouldn't have, I shouldn't have said that. In general, stability in control theory does have a relationship to forms like this, but that's, that's not what I was trying to demonstrate here. Um, so let's talk about the general method then. So the general method for the separation of variables is going to be that dy over dt is equal to g of t over h of y. Um, or the other way of writing it is dy over dt is equal to g of t f of t. And so equations of this type are called separable differential equations because we can separate the variables. So we can separate the y's and the t's onto different sides. And then, um, and then we can solve it with the kind of steps we did before, where first you separate the variables, then you integrate both sides, then you solve for the solution if you can. So um, some things that should be noted. So one thing is you might not be able to solve for y of t on its own. So you might be left with some more implicit function where maybe you have like y plus y squared is equal to something. So, I mean, in that case, of course, with a quadratic formula, you could solve for y probably, but you might be left with some form where you're not actually able to get y of t explicitly on one side, but that you might be able to get some more um, expression that includes y after doing this integration and that that implicitly defines the way that um, y is related to t. And then, um, and then the same thing about what if, um, what about the cases where you have to worry about this like, f um, being zero, and then you would handle those in a, um, in a similar way as before, where you would say like, oh, okay, well then um, the, there's like a special case that I'll handle for the case when the f at a certain time is equal to zero, then, um, then there's a special case that you would make for your solution. So, um, it's important to know the terminology of a general solution. So a general solution to a differential equation is a family of solutions depending on sufficiently many parameters to give all but finitely many solutions. So that means like, that maybe it doesn't account for the case, for example, where you have to worry about what happens if um, the f of t is zero. So, cause you have to treat those as special cases. So uh, like dy over dt equals ty squared, then the solution would be like, y of t equals negative two over t squared plus two c when y does not equal zero and it could be maybe zero for y is zero. So as you can see here, um, we have this solution that depends on this parameter c and it does that for all except this finite number of solutions which is when y is zero and then we have to handle that one as a special case. Okay, you can also use definite integrals. Um, in your integration. So just to go back when we're doing the, um, the integration here, you could do it with a definite integral instead of an indefinite integral if you have the data to take it in a definite form. So now let's go back to the um, problem that we had earlier. So why does the separation of variables method work? And so the reason we said we were gonna think about this is because it seemed that some of the steps here are a little wonky because this part's okay. Where you say, okay, I agree, I have this differential equation. But then doing this part where you say h of y dy equals g of t dt, it's like, hey, wait a minute, that's not really what this means. 
this dy dt is not really like a fraction where I can just split up the parts. Why is it okay that I do this? And why is that part of the separation of variables procedure? So um, I think we can agree that at this step, we're happy. Then if we were to do this, we would still be very happy. People would say, okay, totally allowed by calculus. Now, if we were to integrate both sides with respect to t, what we would get is we would have the integral of h of y dy over dt dt equals the integral of g of t dt. Now, um, there's this change of variables that says um, you can represent uh, dy over dt dt as equal to dy. There's this, um, in fact, in calculus, and we'll get to this when we eventually get to our, our calculus um, lecture as we do more of them, but there's this thing that says the substitution rule back in the book by Stewart. And what it says is it says that if u equals g of x is a differentiable function, whose range is in interval i, and f is continuous on i, then the integral of the composition of the function, so the composition is also a reminder in the calculus lecture posted so far, is equal to this. So um, this rule implies, this is also a statement from Stuart. So this is not part of, that's the rule. Okay, this is not part of the rule, but this is a statement on what that rule is telling us. So this rule implies that it is permissible to operate with dx and du after the integral sign as if they were differentials. And so that's why we're doing this part right here and we're making this change of variables for the integration is because the substitution rule says that if you have something like this, so f of g of x, g prime of x, dx, that then um, is equal to f of u du. So that's what this means, that it implies that it's permissible to operate with dx and du after the integral as if they were differentials. So, um, if we did that change of variables over here, we would get h of y dy is equal to the integral of g of t dt. So as you can see, that's what we have um, up here, just integrated. So even though like, yeah, you cannot really just go from here to here, but because if the next step is integration, we would end up with this. So it's sort of doing like a shortcut because we know where we're going. Maybe mathematically, you wouldn't exactly do this, but it's the procedure for how you kind of keep going. Now, technically this is the more rigorous and correct way, but then um, if you see the shortcut and you agree with the shortcut, you can kind of take the shortcut to um, make it easy for yourself. So, um, okay. Now um, the next part that we're gonna look at is what are called linear equations. So um, linear equations have a very specific form. And so a first order, linear equation. Again, I highlight this is not a system of equations. This is only a single equation. Has the form dx dt equals a of tx plus f of t. And we have that if f of t is equal to zero, the equation has the form dx dt equals a of tx. So um, if we have this, we call this e um, linear equation homogeneous. 
Otherwise, it is inhomogeneous. And so um, the idea with these linear equations is that in a linear equation, the unknown function x and its derivative x prime both appear alone and only to first order. So for example, there will be no x squared or x x prime because here's cases where the derivative and the unknown function are not appearing alone into first order. But you can do stuff like x prime equals sine of t x. This is OK, because the part that um, looks kind of nonlinear here is only containing the t. Um, but if you were to write it slightly different, so if you did x prime equals sine of x t, now it's a problem because now the x is what's having the sign, so that's not linear. OK. So um, let's talk about the solution of the homogeneous equation. So um, this again was the one where we have dx dt equals a of tx. This one is separable, so we could follow the separable stuff and do dx over x a of t dt gives me that ln of x is equal to the integral of a of t dt plus c. And so then we have that x is equal to e to the integral of a of t dt plus c, which is equal to e to the c, e to the integral of a of t dt. And so um, now we're going to replace the e of c with a allowing it to be positive, negative, or zero to remove the absolute value. So we say x of t here is equal to a e to the integral of a of t dt. So then um, there's the solution of the homogeneous equation. So now we got to go back to the part where we say, OK, well, what about the case where I had that like, plus f of, of t part? So this will it will help to see what to do if we look at an example. So we're going to look back at the inhomogeneous equation. So in this case, we're going to look at Newton's law of cooling. And this states that the rate at which an object loses or gains heat is proportional to the difference between the temperature of the object which we'll use the symbol t to denote that and the temperature of the surrounding medium with the proportional, proportionality constant as k. So we're going to have this as dt over dt equals negative k times t minus a. So then we'll rewrite this as dt over dt plus kt equals ka. So nothing too fancy yet. This is my differential equation. And I'm just moving the KT term to the other side. So um, this is a little bit of an interesting step where then they say, hey, you know what? This kind of reminds me of like a derivative of a product because I have this, you, you know how if you have a product, like say you have something like TV and you take the derivative of this with respect to um, T, it would be if both T and V were both dependent on T, it would be like, oh, okay. V dt over dt 
plus T dV over dt. So when, when they say that this kind of reminds them of a product is like, oh, hey, look, it kind of looks like this part and then like this part. So like that one and then this one, but kind of like missing this dV dt type term and missing something here. So um, you could say, okay, well, if I multiplied both sides here by e to the kt, would it be the derivative of some product? So forget about this part now. So let's say that I take e to the kt and I multiply it by both sides. So I multiply it by dt dt plus kt. First, let's check what this part is. So this would be e to the kt dt over dt plus e to the kt kt. And so it turns out that um, we can actually recognize this as equal to e to the kt t. And this is going to mean prime, so derivative. So this is, um, in other words, this is d of e to the kt t over dt. And so we can see that now. So we can see that this is the derivative of this product, that, um, that when we take this derivative, it's e to the kt dt over dt plus e to the kt times kt. So um, that's interesting. So now I'm going to say, OK, so this is now my left-hand side when I multiplied this by e to the kt. So I'm left with that e to the kt t d over dt is equal to e to the kt. Now it's going to be e to the kt times this right-hand side, ka. And so now we're going to integrate both sides. So we're going to end up with um, e to the kt t plus my constant for my indefinite integral equals the integral of ka e to the kt dt, which is equal to ka e to the kt over k, or in other words, a e to the kt. I also need to add this constant c2 here, plus c2. So now I'm going to combine the c2 and the c1 like um, we've done before. And I'm going to say e to the kt t equals a e to the kt plus c. And then I'm going to divide both sides by e to the kt. So it's going to come up with t of t equals a plus c e to the negative kt. So this is now our general solution. So then let's say, OK, uh, what was the actual fundamentals there? Can I always do that? And so let's look at this in a little more abstract notation. So if we have x prime, where prime is the derivative, equals a of t x plus f of t. Or in other words, we could write this as x prime minus a x equals f if we want to kind of remove the explicit dependence on t for notational simplicity. So we want to multiply both sides by some function. So then we say, OK, so I want my goal was to figure out some way to multiply both sides by this function, where when I do that, that I get a very specific result. So my goal is that this will become ux prime. So again, we're saying, can I always do this? And we're saying, well, you could if you were able to find a function that does this. And we call this u is an integrating factor. So if this was possible, we would get ux prime equals u times f. And then, um, and then you would integrate this. So then when you integrate it, you would get u of t x of t equals the integral of u of t f of t dt. And then of course you're going to have like some type of plus c if we're taking indefinite integrals. And then so um, then you can solve for this and say like u of t equals one or sorry x of t equals one over u of t integral of u of t f of t dt plus c over u of t. And so if the u could um, if the u, if we find such a u that does this, then we would be able to achieve like this nice solution of the type of thing that we want. So the, the question is, does the u of t that achieves this exist?
because if it does, this is my general procedure. And so then the answer is, um, let's focus in on this point. So we want this to be true. So if we write that out again, it will say that u prime or ux prime equals u times x prime minus ax, which we can write out and say that that's ux prime plus u prime x equals ux prime minus aux. And so if we um, cancel the two things that are the same, so this one and this one, we end up with u prime x equals negative aux. And then um, this would be true, again, if we cancel the x's, we would say that would be true if u prime equals negative au. And so um, look at this, this is back to a linear homogeneous equation. And so from what we did above, we already know that the solution of this is u of t equals e to the negative integral of a of t dt. And so um, that would be a workable integrating factor. So overall, when dealing with the integrating factors, here's the way to do it. So um, you can solve x prime equals ax plus f, this inhomogeneous linear equation, by one, rewriting it as x prime minus ax equals f. Two, you need to multiply by the integrating factor. And remember that your integrating factor is um, the u that is given by this equation. So very specifically, the integrating factor you're going to use is u equals e to the negative integral of a of t dt. And then that is going to give you um, that u x prime equals u times x prime minus a x equals u f. And then um, three, you would integrate to get ux equals integral of u f dt plus c. And then finally, you will um, solve for x. And then it's also always a good idea to double check you got it right. Because you can actually tell if you get a solution of a differential equation, because you can plug it back in the original differential equation and check it satisfies it. So you should do that. So then um, let's just, to show that in action, let's do a quick example. So here's x prime equals x plus e to the negative t. So we're going to do dx over dt equals, oh, sorry, uh, dx over dt minus x. So this is that first step where they say write it in this way, equals e to the negative t. Then you're going to get the integrating factor. So it's e to the negative um, a here is equal to one in this expression if you compare it with the equation where they got a from on the prior part here. You can say a, a is this coefficient for the, um, for the x and there's already a negative here. So you can see that is a is one right here. And so what you get then is integral of one dt equals e to the negative t. And then, so you have e to the negative t times dx over dt minus x equals e to the negative t times um, e to the negative t. We're multiplying by e to the negative t on both sides. That's the second side multiplied by e to the negative t. So this is equal to e to the negative 2t. And then if we do e to the negative t times dx over dt minus e to the negative t x equals d of e to the negative t x over dt. So you can see this is the step where we um, get this combination of u and x together. And then um, the next part is that then you say, okay, dE to the negative tx over dt is equal to e to the negative 2t. Then um, finally, you take the integral on both sides. So this is going to give you e to the negative tx equals the integral of e to the negative 2t dt equals e to the negative 2t over negative 2 plus c. And so I'm running out of room here. So I'm going to write this on the side so that we can keep this all on one slide. So then this goes e to the negative 2t over negative 2e to the negative t plus ce to the t. And then finally, this gives me my solution. And here we go. 
And so that gives you some idea. Um, in the book I was looking at, then they go through and they say, oh, there's another way of doing the same thing. And it's called variation of parameters. And it's almost the same method, slightly different, but it will give you the same solution. There's also, of course, Laplace transforms, which is another way of solving. But I think that um, there is really, honestly, relatively little value for most things in engineering um, research involving mathematics, where knowing every single way of solving a differential equation that are all equivalent, um, especially of differential equation of this form, right? A differential equation with a single state, um, it just, I cannot see too much value in going over more of these ways at the graduate level. So do there exist more ways of solving this? Yes. Are there things like Laplace transform and variation parameters? Yes. Is it probably immensely useful to you in reading the literature? For the most part, probably no, unless you're doing control theory, then you should know your control, you should know your Laplace transform for control, but I think that can be saved for control class. So that covers um, the first two sections of chapter one. Thank you.